Welcome to my DEF CON Ham Radio Village talk on my Rover van. My name is Pete Kobach and my call sign is Kilo Zero Bravo Alpha Kilo. I want to say first that I'm really happy to be here at DEF CON even virtually because uh, I spent 17 years in web application security and although I attended quite a few security conferences in that time, I never did get to DEF CON so I'm glad I'm here now and I'm glad you're here with me. I first got licensed relatively recently after waiting 40 years when I first uh, had an interest in ham radio as a teenager but didn't have money and then didn't have time with a uh, family and career. And I had, uh, I had been fascinated by reading about the activity of roving, either activating counties and state QSO parties or grids and VHF contests. And my first effort was in 2014 in the Pennsylvania QSO party, my home state. And I won the category, mostly because there wasn't much competition in the category. But still, I had a lot of fun doing it, and uh, it wasn't bad to win either. So uh, a, a kind of a career was started there in, uh, in roving and contests. When I first started, I used the family minivan, and on the left here, you can see four low VHF bands uh, on a rotator in the back of the van. And here is the HF antenna I started with, which was an elevated ground plane. I since replaced that with the screwdriver antenna because although this antenna works well, it takes too long to set up. Although I had fun operating the family minivan, it was a pain in the neck to have to tear it to tear it down each time after I'm done and then build it out the next time. Also couldn't drill holes, so I was thinking, gee, it sure would be nice to have a dedicated vehicle. The ultimate such vehicle would be electronic news gathering. It would have a pneumatic mass, power, and racks, and it would be a perfect base for a VHF ham rover. I looked I looked every so often, uh, not really very seriously. They always seem to be offered far away and uh, um, wasn't really looking in any kind of systematic way. However, in the summer of 2016, my buddy Rob found the TV van that was only two hours away. So we went up there. Uh, since he's a gearhead, he gave it a uh, mechanical thumbs up. We saw that the generated pneumatic mass worked, and uh, after going away for a couple of weeks and thinking about it, I, act, I purchased it and paid for it in effect by delaying my retirement. Here's a list of the uh, features in the van. I won't go through these step by step, but uh, a pneumatic mast, power generators, a powerful engine because it's a, uh, it's a quite a heavy vehicle and a flat roof with a ladder that was meant for TV reporting that would make it easier to climb up there and install antennas that I needed. Here's what the van looked like when it was on offer at the dealer. You can see some uh, uh, pretty heavy antennas on the roof of the van that would have to be removed for my own antennas to be installed. And here's a look at the interior production area where you can see that they removed all their expensive equipment and left the cables behind. Now I bought the van at the end of October of 2016, uh, registered it, replaced the batteries, and uh, something I didn't even think about was garaging it. So uh, I didn't have a garage tall enough for it, so I threw a, a tarp over it, which didn't work all that well, then certainly didn't look very good. and. Uh, didn't have any build progress that winter. In the spring, I took down the antennas I could by uh, by disassembling it and uh, walking the antennas down the, the ladder. But the front antenna for satellite was too heavy. And uh, another buddy of mine from a VHF club, Phil K3TOF, helped me by uh, taking it off with a pulley at, a, uh, at his pole, at his, uh, pole barn. Ironically, the first radio that I had installed in the van was not a ham radio, but uh, was a 
was a combination radio backup camera and uh, navigation device. Also had a Bluetooth player for uh, long drives, which is not a small thing when you're doing a long drive by yourself. One of my first bad surprises was uh, in the spring after I bought it, um, I found that the, the generator, the motor part started right up, which is good, but there was no voltage I could find. I was surprised by this because we saw the meters on at the dealer and it ran the pneumatic mass. At least I thought so. I finally discovered that the AC we saw at the dealer had come from the van engine. And uh, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that I didn't even know it had that feature. I guess it's good to have the feature, but bad that I didn't know about it. So uh, the generator part of that gasoline gen set had to be rebuilt expensively and it took quite a while. At the same time, uh, 2017 is my first year of retirement, and I did a lot of operating because I had the freedom to do so. And uh, because I was operating, I didn't make much progress on the on the van. Finally, at near the end of the year, I deconstructed the minivan Rover in the hopes that I would have more time, or force myself at least to have more time to outfit the outfit the TV van. The next winter, I found a garage for it um, that was relatively new, and the problem was it was one hour drive each way, but at least I had a place to keep it over the winter and could do some work inside during the winter months. The first big project in the winter was to remove the, the cables that were left behind. I did so by not cutting them, but uh, removing them and putting them aside or or wrapping them up here on the side and cleaning the whole van, which had not seen much cleaning since it was built in 2001. First thing I ever built for the van was a shore power connection. Uh, here's a little a little cable with a adapter that was uh, kind of unusual. You would have thought thought it would be standard in the RV world. It was not, so it was hard to find and surprisingly expensive. But uh, at least my first build was successful. Uh, first of many things I've built for the van down the down the years. Now, in 2018, unfortunately, most progress halted because of a major uh, series of basement floods we had at home. It took out my home station and spent, forced me to spend a lot of time fixing it up or preparing it to be fixed up and, and renewed again. So very little progress was made on the TV van because of that. In 2019, though, I uh, had quite a bit of progress in, in the van. I won't go through this entire list, but uh, uh, one of the big features of that year was operating in the Canadian National Parks on the Air program, installing radios, the power systems I used during that operation, and uh, uh, a microwave power shelf. So uh, in contrast to the previous year, I did make a lot of progress two years ago. In this calendar year, though, it the major theme, including the end of uh, the very end of last year, was mechanical problems with the with the engine, in particular the uh, serpentine belt in the engine. So uh, the van was out of commission for many weeks in two different events, uh, not allowing me to uh, make progress in building or operating the van. In between the events, I did go on what I called Corona Roves to local parks and operated from parks since I could still be isolated from other people while operating inside the van. Uh, and right at the moment, the station's down for upgrades, but that's a good thing, and it'll be back on the air shortly. Now I'd like to talk about uh, power, which was most of my effort of building the interior of the van so far. So I, so I started with surveying the capabilities of the van as is. The van has three 5 kilowatt AC sources, a generator set that I talked about, uh, an origin that was power from the uh, vehicle, and the plug-in shore power. So the problem with the generator set was that it was very loud inside. I mean, in audio-wise, it was it was really loud and shaky. And not only was it loud inside the van, 
if I was every, anywhere uh, where the public would be, like a park, um, it would be really distracting and uh, not a nice thing to, to subject other people to. The origin is relatively quiet because just the van engine is running, but it RF-wise, it was horribly, horribly noisy, so that was out. Um, lastly, there's RF noise just from the van engine, even when the origin system wasn't on. So my overall conclusion was that I needed batteries for doing weak signal radio. I couldn't rely on any of the internal generating sources. The DC power system included two, uh, uh, two batteries wired in parallel permanently, um, which, was, which was a shame because it would have been nice if the auxiliary battery was, was switched in. I noticed there was no protection for high current circuits which made some uh, some uh, additions to the DC power system dangerous. I did have available 320 amp radio DC circuits, but uh, that's really not enough power to, to even have uh, barefoot power, no less amplifiers. The battery charger that they left behind that I started trying to use was actually burned out, which is probably why they left it behind. And... Uh, so my overall conclusion was that I also needed a separate radio station DC power system. I couldn't take much advantage of anything that was existing in the van for DC power. So what were my uh, power assumptions when I started? I was going to use my, my home station Flex 5000 SDR. So the thing about the that series of flex radios was that the radio processing was, processing was done on a PC via firewire. Uh, the laptop was out of the question because of uh, using less reliable connections, so I needed to use a rock mount desktop class PC. And that meant I needed AC power for that PC. So going through this, this line of assumptions led me to the conclusion that the station would be based on AC power and DC would come from conventional power supplies just like you'd use at home. And I'd use, a, use batteries and inverter for AC power because as I said before I couldn't rely on the internal generators. I decided on the, that the AC power would be up to 3 kilowatts so I could eventually accommodate legal limit amplifiers. And I wanted to make that decision once because it was heavy and hard to wire. So I wanted to make sure I was future proof even if I wasn't going out with legal limit amplifiers at first. I would use direct battery power for the station DC and I would use dual batteries for flexibility. Either gee, I could use the AC inverter um, for one from one battery with the DC supply from another or maybe I could use one while charging the other. I knew I would I would get good flexibility by having two batteries. And lastly I would need a charger maintainer for the van batteries because it would be the van would be in storage a lot of the time and like any vehicle you need to maintain those lead acid batteries. Hey, here's a uh, Here's a diagram of the overall power design context. Now, I, I first have to apologize because my writing is so terrible. It seems like I learned to print and to draw and didn't make and and then just stopped learning when I was uh, at the age of seven. So my drawings are awful, and I don't have the time or patience to draw them in a in a uh, you know a drawing program. So. Um, I hope you forgive me for these for these awful looking diagrams. But anyway. Uh, the overall context diagram includes the old systems and the new systems, includes both AC and DC. And we're going to be going over many of these systems one at a time. Well, we went over the requirements, the context diagram, and now we'll spend some time on the implementation of those power systems. Here's a picture of the, the key power components. Here's that 3 kilowatt inverter charger switch that I mentioned, and here are two 200 amp hour each nominally 12 volt batteries. These are 115 pounds each, so uh, that, it, they are quite beefy um, batteries that can deliver an enormous amount of current.
even just mounting the batteries required skills I didn't have before, and that's one theme I wanted to uh, to bring out that this entire project taught me quite a few really basic mechanical real world skills I didn't have before. Many people learn how to do things like a cut with a table saw when they're when they're in the teenage years. I didn't know any of that. I had like a uh, a, a virtual life on computers my almost my entire career so this was new to me and it was scary of making my first cut on my first table on my first table saw so uh, um, this is just one especially dangerous example of things that I learned to do just for the sake of the van so using that table saw and my newfound skills I cut boards to constrain the those 115 pound batteries horizontally use straps that you can just barely see here and here to constrain the batteries vertically and uh, here is a binding post to tie together all the negative side of the system so let me describe the AC part of the system build over here, here's the uh, the native AC system that was already in the uh, in the van, and here is my new AC system, um, the the inverter charger switch can supply current to the AC system um, in a in a back feed arrangement, and the power is supplied from the shore power into the new AC system into that big blue box I showed. Um, I would have 15 amp outlets that uh, that are existing in the racks and I would also build 25 amp outlets that were brand new. And to run off of battery power there would also be a very large 200 amp capacity connection to the battery system. So here's a diagram of the AC power circuit. What I did was to um, connect into, rather than replace, I connected into existing AC circuits in the van. So here is a supply that I pulled off of the, um, I pulled off of these original circuits that are no longer used in the van to supply AC power into the inverter, say from shore power. When I'm, uh, when I'm uh, for instance, charging the batteries, and then the output of the inverter would go through a uh, a new 30 amp circuit breaker, and then branch off into two of the racks for a 15 existing 15 amp circuit and another existing 15 amp circuit for the other two racks. And lastly, I install two new sockets for higher current AC supply. And here's what the uh, here's what the new AC power panel looked like. This is the main circuit breaker. Here are the uh, two 15 amp circuit breakers uh, uh, on, in a double arrangement. And there here are two higher current sockets for someday for legal limit amplifiers that require this amount of AC current. Here are the um, two multi-wired cables going back to the electrical panel. We'll take a look at the electrical panel shortly. And here's that same system um, mounted onto the back of rack number one. Now these two, these two multi-wire cables go to the AC distribution in the back driver's side of the van, which looks like this. Um, this is a before picture and this is an after picture and you can see those same two multi-wire cables coming up into the panel on this side and being wired into existing circuits and you can see that I was lucky that this terminal block had a lot of unused circuits so that made it a lot easier than it would otherwise have been to wire in my own uh, my own connections into the AC panel now I added some labels to the native power panel to tell me uh, how the switches should be laid out at least in ordinary operating conditions so this is the uh, this would be the input power into the 
into that uh, big blue box, the inverter charger switch. And these, even though they're off in this picture, these should would normally always be on. And in contrast, I am connecting the output of the of that inverter to these two circuits. So normally these would be off because I already have current on them, but this does allow me to do a back feed into the rest of the AC system if I had some emergency that would require me to supply AC to other parts of the van besides the rack circuits that were intended. Now here's uh, both DC power panels, and we'll be going into this in detail. Uh, this is a picture at the bottom of rack number two, or in other words, the middle of the three racks. So I'm first going to be talking about the, the battery system that's really at the core of the entire system that supplies power to both the AC system that we just talked about and to the station power. The battery circuit is relatively simple electrically, but it was hard to build because of the, the size of the cables that I had to deal with. So you can see that here there are two, the two batteries I showed in the picture earlier. Each battery has uh, two fuses mounted right on the terminal, which I didn't even know existed before I started this project. So that's a, a, that's a nice uh, safety feature to have a fuse right on the terminal of the battery. Um, 200 amp coming off of each battery for the inverter charger to give it enough power to supply uh, three kilowatts of AC power and then the 80 amp circuit coming off of each battery goes to this switch and then to the station power system here. Here's more of a close-up of the uh, battery switch panel. Um, so here are the two switches that I showed in the in that circuit diagram. They can select either battery or both together or of course both on or I'm sorry both off uh, these two green panel meters alternately show voltage and current but only when their respective switches on and this is this is always shows voltage to the batteries no matter the switch position all these meters are only on when the meter switch is on. That allows me to not drain the battery unnecessarily when, say, the, the van is in storage. Here's the back of that same panel. You can see uh, how large some of these cables are. This is a quad zero gauge wire. It's very big and very expensive and uh, really hard to work with, as you might imagine. These are two double zero cables that go to each battery and this is the 200 amp side of the circuit and of course this is the 80 amp side of the circuit with four gauge wire being used for that wiring. Here's a top view that of the installed batteries with the uh, uh, with the two fuses that I mentioned earlier here connecting to the panel and you can just barely see down here the common connection point for all the negative leads. In between the two batteries is a, uh, which I'll be talking about shortly, an 80 amp boost regulator. It just happened to fit very well between the batteries just by chance so uh, it's a nice spot for it's nice and cozy in there without having to take up say a uh, rack space so that was a that was a lucky thing. Now let's talk about the two-way charging system. And here are the controls for the for that um, two-way charging system. On the right is a, a another another instance of that volt ammeter. In this case, this is showing the voltage and current from the from or to the van battery system. This is a meter switch like I talked before, so I could turn this meter off when the van is in storage. And here's a double throw switch that allows me to put current in either direction into the batteries from or to the the um, native vehicle battery. So on the in the up position, I can charge the station from the van alternator while the van is in operation. In the down position, I can charge the the um, van batteries when the of course when the um, van is stationary I can charge the van batteries 
while um, while AC power is supplied. Here's a circuit of that two-way charging system. So the so the key part of the system is these two 65 amp solenoids that uh, connect the station battery to the vehicle battery um, when necessary. These are in turn energized by a uh, by this smaller capacity relay that fires six seconds after the ignition signal is set. I have this six second delay in order to allow the the van engine to stabilize before I connect the the large station batteries to the van batteries. And down here is a um, something called a battery tender, or in other words a battery maintainer charger and um, this can be switched in or, or, or out by that double throw toggle switch that I showed in the panel before and this supplies current into the van DC system with the solenoids off in that position so I can charge into the van DC system. Next I'm going to talk about the station power system and that is fed from the battery system with uh, uh, up to 80 amps and then moves as a, a regulated 80 amps into station equipment or into the computer. And here's the station power control panel on the left hand side of that uh, of the same rack panel I showed before. One controls the input into the uh, into the 80 amp booster and the other controls whether I am supplying power to HF components, VHF components or both. The station battery switch output that uh, 80 amp um, switch I showed on the lower panel first goes to a, a MIDI fuse block to supply current to the unregulated battery output binding post supplies current in from the two-way charging system I showed earlier and the main circuit is a 80 amp fuse that protects the rest of the system for all the other station components. There's a panel switch that I, I showed in the previous picture that um, that can turn this circuit on or off and also can have a supply instead of from the station batteries from some um, power supply if I ever wanted to run the station on AC instead of DC. That goes into that 80 amp boost regulator that was between the two batteries that I showed earlier. I have a shunt resistor and an analog meter to measure the instantaneous current being used by the entire system and the output of the boost regulator goes to binding posts for further distribution. And here is that further distribution. You can, this is the connection point from the left hand side of the previous diagram. Uh, one side goes to an unswitched power pole distribution for things like radios that I'm going to use for both HF and VHF. The rest of the the rest of the distribution goes through the panel switch to select either the HF or VHF equipment and the HF uh, cable goes into a MIDI fuse box on another rack shelf into the amplifier and a power pole distribution for HF only components like the screwdriver antenna and the uh, remote SWR meter. In the VHF position we have a, a high current and a low current connection. The high current goes through a MIDI fuse box that I used in my old minivan rover to go to four medium power amplifiers for the low VHF bands. And another branch goes to a power pole distribution system for low current components like a uh, small flex radio amplifier fans, transverters, and an SWR power uh, meter power system. One little branch circuit from the uh, previous diagram goes through a fuse box that can distribute unregulated battery power and the only component using that so far is the computer and we'll talk about that a little bit later.
here's a picture of the uh, station power distribution shelf. So this is the connector I showed before that was scary to put on because it was a uh, live hot uh, DC that would have uh, that would have welded my tools if I wasn't careful. Uh, the two fuses for the input DC from the van. Here's the solenoid relays and the relay timer for um, for the delay of uh, connecting the station batteries to the van alternator. Here's the first um, fuse box for the distribution of uh, battery power to uh, three different destinations, the most important of which is the uh, booster and that cable goes here to the front panel switch that selects either the booster I'm sorry selects either the battery or a power supply for the input to the booster the booster is underneath this panel and comes out here on the hot side and on the ground side so this is where the regulated voltage comes out from the booster uh, that can be connected to directly or another circuit goes to another panel switch that allows me to switch to either VHF distribution over here or to HF distribution over here. Above that uh, station distribution shelf is an accessories rack shelf uh, that includes a uh, a uh, system to power laptops that I normally that I no longer use in the in the van, but that this was a big help when I was transitioning off of laptops into the um, into a permanently installed computer. On this side are the three connection blocks that I that I talked about in the previous circuit diagram. This is this the direct station battery unregulated 12 volts from the station batteries that go to the uh, to the PC. This power pole distribution block is the unswitched power that goes to things like radios that I need for both HF and VHF. And here, as you can see on the label, is uh, the power pole distribution for VHF only components like transverters. Now I'd like to talk about the build out of the uh, HF and 6 meter amplifiers and uh, there's a series of photographs that show uh, the build process just as an example of, of how I, I built these things out for better or worse. The HF amplifier is an Ameritron 500M amplifier which produces about 400 RF watts. Um, this, this is the side of the distribution um, that supply HF only power poles for other lower current devices and uh, we're going to see a series of construction pictures next. Here's the amplifier mounted using a, uh, a piece of angled aluminum where I screwed in the screwed in the uh, aluminum into existing um, screw holes for the cover of the amplifier and then these vertical bolts bolt down into the um, into the rack shelf. After the amplifier I put in wood in the other spaces in order to mount um, the rest of the system here and I use for future items here which turned out to be the 6 meter amplifier that I'll talk about. Here's just mounting the main components in the back And here we are wired. Um, here's the high current connections to the uh, amplifier through these uh, MIDI fuses. And one more branch goes to this small power pole distribution. And you can see this unusual connection of just the positive side. This is the bias voltage, which is a separate wire uh, that goes into the Ameritron amplifier. And finally, and finally, this is the system actually mounted in the van um, with all the connections. Uh, here is a remote probe for uh, SWR and RF power that I connected to the output of the of the amplifier. Here's several of the HF only components, including this screwdriver and the and that probe. Here is a PT line from the amplifier to uh, to hit the relay during transmission for the for the amplifier and finally here the here's the power input into this shelf from the 
uh, station booster shelf, the picture of which I showed earlier uh, with uh, two four gauge cables that go down to that other shelf. Now, just this week, uh, I installed a 6 meter amplifier that I had for a long time and a 50 volt power system. So the amplifier needed 50 volts and I decided to supply that with my first big lithium battery and also built a switching, monitoring, and inrush board that I'll show later. Here's the mount board for the 6 meter amplifier that I used to help, uh, to help tie, tie down that amplifier. The legs go into these glued down PVC caps. I have uh, four eyelets for uh, small bungee cords to constrain the amplifier vertically and these are four countersunk holes so I can put wood, wood screws into the piece of wood that's below this uh, mounting board. And here's the amplifier mounted next to the uh, HF amplifier. Now there's two years between these two things. I built this shelf with the, amplif with the HF amplifier two years ago and this was just uh, this week that I put the 6 meter amplifier in. Here's a picture of that uh, large 50 volt 50 amp battery with some of the tools I use for the for the connections. And here's what the battery looked like. Um, before I put the restraining boards in, I put the battery in with the connector to make sure everything fit as I expected before starting to make cuts. And as you can see, uh, this is the that AC distribution I, I talked about early in my presentation. And here is the box for the generator. So this this little kind of cubby hole is otherwise wasted space. So um, although I had to turn the battery on its side, it was a nice fit, a nice use for otherwise wasted space. That uh, cable from the battery is mounted on a board, and the board is mounted on the side of the van, and this represents the connection point for the battery. This allows me to uh, connect or disconnect the battery as necessary for my different operations. Here's the 50 volt power shelf uh, that I that I built recently. This is a this is a box that contains a, a shunt resistor for the metering system and a bolted down uh, MIDI battery. And this is the cable for the um, for supplying the the voltages to the to the battery monitor here in the front. This is all in a uh, like a treasure box, a wooden treasure box from a hobby store, kind of hillbilly engineering I call it, but I can close this lid to protect all these different connection points. I'm kind of paranoid now that I'm at 50 volts versus 14 volts. That can supply quite a shock. Over here, maybe the most unusual looking part of this system is uh, these resistors connected in parallel, also mounted in a uh, in a hobby box. Um, this is for un inrush current protection. What I saw was uh, when I used this amplifier several years ago was that there was a, a quite a spark of a uh, very high current as the capacitors got charged up from uh, uh, the capacitors of the amplifiers got charged up from the battery and that kind of big inrush of current is not good for the battery and it's not good for the connectors so uh, a feature that I included was an inrush current protection by forcing the initial current to go through um, a total of 16 ohms that limits the current to less than 4 amps and then that rapidly degrades to uh, uh, to allow me to give it allow me to give it full power. Two switches on the front, one to um, charge the battery through this uh, conventional power pole connection so the the charger gets connected here and I have one position for the charge the other position goes to this other switch one position of which forces the current through the 16 ohm resistor for uh, for inrush current limitation and the other position number two position is a straight connection into the amplifier without the resistors for normal operation and here this is a um, this is a meter that I had removed to make room for this shelf and uh, this was this was just simply a convenient place to put this uh, meter that monitors the voltage for my booster and my my batteries for the 14 volt system. So this has nothing to do with the 50 volt system. It was just a, a convenient place because I have a limited amount of rack space. 
And lastly, here's the, the whole system um, uh, configured for test. You can barely see maybe the uh, um, the the numbers on the on the meter that shows that uh, shows instantaneous voltage, amperage, and shows uh, overall amp hours and watt hours. So that's this meter glowing here. Uh, you can see the lights on over here at the at the at the amplifier. This is an actually an HF dummy load that's supposed to go up to, as you can see, goes up to 30 megahertz. But I I used it because I didn't have any other dummy load that could take that much power. Um, it was a 1.6 to 1 SWR at low power, so uh, so I didn't want to fire this. 6 meter amplifier up all the way but I did verify that it uh, it puts out 20 times the power that's put into it um, I tested it up to 600 watts with a FM carrier so I'm satisfied it basically works and nothing smoked so <laughs> it was uh, it was nice to have that first test go well I have not yet installed VHF Equipment, although um, my VHF equipment is uh, is battle tested, I have it installed the shelves. But uh, when I do, each band will be on one shelf. Each one will include a medium power amplifier, which I kind of referred to earlier in a uh, the power distribution power distribution schematic. Um, I'll have a digital SWR meter for probes for each band, so I can see the power going going out of each amplifier. And uh, as I mentioned. All the VHF equipment is already contest proven, so I have confidence that the equipment I have will work. It's just a matter of uh, of uh, mounting it. The uh, 10 meter or 28 megahertz IF that goes into the transverter port will will come from the milliwatt output of the uh, of the Flex Radio 6500, and I'll probably have a manual switch for selecting which band gets that IF initially but uh, I do want to do want to install an automatic switch so I can select the band from the radio and have the IF switch through a relay and I have that I have those components but I want to do one step at a time it was good to talk about the power first but next I want to talk about the radio and computers in the van when I first started and I made major uh, major assumptions about power systems. I originally aimed to use the Flex 5000, which was my first 100 watt radio that I use at home. It uh, it's it's well suited because it has transverter outputs and multiple multiple RF and PTT outputs that you'd expect at a from a flagship radio. And the need for the need for a a good powerful PC for this SVR drove the decision originally to use AC power for the van. Now what happened that uh, after I installed the entire AC system uh, one of my VHF club members offered a new generation Flex 6500 for a surprisingly low price. Um, uh, that series that latest series from Flex Radio includes self-contained computing power so you don't need a big PC got fantastic programmable interface for driving relays that makes um, some downstream work a lot easier than it would be with uh, with uh, any other radio that I know of it also has the same transverter and multiple programmable PTT outputs as my 5000 and lastly not a big thing but it's nice that it directly supports rack mounting so I did buy that <laughs> even though I made a lot of expensive decisions to uh, uh, that that were um, the foundation of which were the assumption I was going to use the Flex 5000. So I now have a Flex 6500 in the van, and here it is mounted. Uh, here's the front of the radio, which currently most of that's obscured by my monitor, um, but I do have a I do have access to the power button. That's the most important thing. Um, and here's the connections to the uh, headphones and the um, and the foot switch. And here's a view of the rear of the radio. It's not it's it's not the flagship of the of the line, but it has enough connections to uh, to make things worthwhile. And you'll see the most unusual connection for most radios is this Ethernet connection, and that connects to my PC in order to to have a GUI for this radio. Because you can see on the front panel there is there are no conventional controls like a VFO knob.
Another radio I installed was the ICOM IC7100. That was my first mobile radio for both HF and VHF rover contesting. Um, so it, it has HF, it has two VHF, um, well, I guess three if you count six meters, three VHF or UHF um, band. So it's a, it's a really nice, tremendous value radio, and uh, I use as a backup radio, maybe an IF for, my, for the microwaves, maybe as a FM radio for, uh, uh, for just um, making contacts to the local repeater. Anyway, it's a jack-of-all-trades radio that was uh, turned out to be vital because an older radio broke when I was on a major rove in Canada and I was able to, to uh, use that, I, that IC7100 in the, uh, in the rove preventing a major disaster for that long trip. And this just shows the uh, that IC7100 under test um, and various components of the of that rack shelf, where the main unit of the IC7100 is tied down here. This is a PTT connections because it's a small radio, so um, everything comes out of this uh, multi-pin connection that allows me access to this. And this is an automatic screwdriver antenna tuner, which I really don't use that much, but I had it, so I mounted it with the radio that it operates with. Now again, another decision that was based on originally wanting to use the Flex 5000 that needs a big PC was to get a desktop class rack mounted PC. I had this built by a specialist vendor who uh, um, built PCs especially for that, that series of Flex radios. Now, with the new generation, the Flex 6500, it's overkill. I don't need anywhere near that amount of CPU power, but I already have it, so that's what I'm using. Later on, I replaced the original AC power supply from the vendor with a DC supply. Uh, in other words, what I mean by DC supply is that it's a computer power supply, but instead of the input being AC, it's DC. That thing was expensive, but it eliminated the original need for the AC base station. And again, boy, I wish I made that decision a year before because <laughs> I spent a lot of time and money getting an AC base station built. Uh, the that, um, that power supply accepts a wide voltage input, and uh, that voltage accepted is within the range of the raw battery. So I don't have to I don't have to regulate that voltage. I can just connect it to my batteries as is through of course uh, uh, through of course a distribution system that I showed you earlier so uh, this PC works great with the new flex 6500 and also works with the older 3000 or 5000 lines because it has a, a good firewire connection now what I did was uh, br brought out the 5 volts and 12 volts from inside the PC to a connector outside uh, for the for use of low current logic like Arduino boards or relay boards uh, rather than having a separate DC power supply for those components. So I haven't actually used that yet, but uh, that's going to save some rack space and possibly save some additional source of RF noise. And lastly, at least uh, I have a video adapter in there that supports a UHD 4K monitor, not all uh, built-in video systems of a of a PC without a separate adapter would, would support a, uh, a high def monitor and that is a big deal to me. That's a big help. So here's the rack mount PC, uh, the back of the, the PC anyway. Nothing very remarkable except it uh, does take a lot of room in the, in the rack and it's kind of heavy. And actually one of my projects that I'm going to do shortly is to reinforce this because I really should have some, some uh, weight support in the back of this this PC rather than just laying it hang from the front. And just to emphasize again, this is the power input to the to the uh, to the PC, and uh, the that DC input power supply is uh, supplied through these input terminals where normally the modular AC connector would be. My computer monitor is a 4K monitor. Uh, it's kind of mounted kind of floppy, but uh, I'm working on an improved mount. There's enough room for an SDR interface and many windows. And man, screen real estate is really vital in, in today's ham contest. Uh, 
uh, that you have chat pages, you have uh, monitoring systems, you have the your logger, you have a uh, rotator control. So uh, all these controls are are, uh, are soft controls. So it takes a lot of real of uh, of uh, monitor real estate space. Now I use Samsung monitors. I used a smaller one before, and what um, at least they used to. I don't know what the what the situation is today, but many of the the mid range and above Samsung monitors use a separate AC to 14 volt adapter. I don't know of any other manufacturer that has a 14 volt input. So what's nice there is I can replace the the power brick that takes AC with a power pole connector, so I can directly supply DC voltage from my station supply as the input into the into the monitor. So. Um, Ed, just a recommendation if you want to if you want to run your monitor from station power uh, look into the Samsung monitors uh, and uh, and you'll have a, a little bit of little bit of simplicity in one less brick one less source of RF interference and here's a, a picture of the of the operating position showing that monitor and the and the nice amount of uh, re of screen real estate this is a old radio they used to use they used to use a flex 3000 that's been replaced and here's one of the most important things i ever bought which was a battery operated fan and this is blowing right at my face and it is a difference between operating in 90 degree weather or not operating in 90 degree weather remember the van is off there's no um, there's no air conditioning in the van when i'm operating so having that fan be able to blow on me is uh is a huge help on hot summer days Next, I'm going to go quickly through uh, microwaves that I've, uh, the progress I've made on microwaves so far in the van. Now, I was just starting to buy used microwave uh, equipment, even for, even in my minivan days. Uh, that's kind of like my normal pattern where I, if I know I'm going to go someplace down the road, if I see an inexpensive piece of equipment being offered, i will just buy it up knowing that I would use it for the future. Now then a uh, then a successful pack rat that's my VHF club's name um, a rover retired from roving and he sold me his complete set of working microwave bands from from 33 centimeters or 903 uh, megahertz all the way up to 24 gig they were put aside so that I could, till I could work on them I concentrated first on the lower five microwave bands because they were interior mounted. Uh, the physically, the 33 and 23 centimeter bands were separate on two on a two tier wood mounts, and the next three bands were all on one long plywood board. So I had a project to separate all the equipment and mount them each on a rack shelf. Now here's those. Uh, three bands on one big plywood board I talked about what I did was I believe it or not and I can't believe it myself sometimes um, I put that big board on the I did do a little bit of separation first but um, here because they're so close together but uh, I actually ran the table saw I showed you earlier I ran that table saw to physically disconnect um, each of these bands and then mount each band on a separate rack shelf it's hard to see, but uh, you can just barely see the outline of each shelf in this bottom row of pictures. And here are those the first five microwave bands mounted in the in the fourth rack. This is the rack that you can see uh, directly in when you first enter the side door of the van. Uh, so it goes 903 up to 5 gig. Down the bottom here are two. Uh, 12 volt batteries about the size of a, a normal car battery although they're deep cycle AGM batteries and their charger so this is the basic supply for the for the power for the microwaves and here's a picture of the rear um, not terribly interesting and a lot of the mess of wires those green wires and blue wires are actually left over from the old band so I'll probably be taking those out before making the connections on the back Power requirements of the micros included um, high current 26.5 volts, high current 12.6 volts for for uh, the 
four low bands. Um, and of course, all the bands require nominal 12 volts for transverters, etc., like most radio equipment does. And I had a requirement for 5 volts for, for TTL logic and uh, USB. My peak power estimate was uh, 250 watts total. Now, one unusual problem was that these are, uh, most of them anyway, are Class A amplifiers. So there's a large current draw whether or not there's RF applied. So one of my requirements that I would supply power only when the particular band was selected. And uh, the relays on my distribution board should energize with uh, uh, grounding of the 24 volt system because that's the same procedure that's used for the IF relays I had. The control po the uh, control power supplies would be uh, separate and I'd wanted to monitor the current and voltages in the system. So here's the board I built to meet all those requirements. Uh, central to it of course are these two power supplies that have uh, that have the two voltage outputs I need 12.6 and 26.5 and they are powered from nominally uh, 24 volts from the two batteries that are on the bottom the two 12 volt batteries are are in series and the the only reason I made that decision versus a, a 12 volt supply at higher current was that I couldn't find power supplies with these outputs at these currents um, at anything less than a 24 volt supply. Here are my meters in the front. I'll have a better view of that later. Uh, yet another um, uh, another shunt resistor to measure instantaneous current and the distribution of the distribution of voltage to the various components and the power supplies. Uh, here are two relays that I used uh, to switch in from the front panel, and here's my much smaller 5 volt. Um, 5 volt power supply. Here is a, uh, a self-contained, I bought this as one unit, self-contained relay board with four relays. This meets my requirements of only supplying power to the um, high current amplifiers when their particular band is selected. So um, you can see that the there's two connections for 26 and two connections for 12 volts that are controlled by the relays and then the um, the triggers here that are 24 volts, the triggers are brought out in this uh, smaller terminal strip. And over here, this is meeting my requirement for the distribution of plain old 12 volts to the various components like tra like transverters, and these are all powered from, of course, the 12 volt power supply side. So quite a lot going on in this board, and uh, this took me quite a long time to, to lay out all the components, no less build it all out. Here's the front power panel. Uh, the analog ammeter is here. This is the battery monitor volt of uh, the battery voltage monitor that has a little graphic that shows how much power is left, which is possible because they're AGM batteries rather than uh, lithium batteries. Uh, here are th three switches for turning on the power supplies individually, and these are uh, meters, digital meters that monitor the volt the the three different available voltages. The reason I went to all the trouble of having separate switches for the uh, power supplies was to limit inrush current so I could switch each power supply on in turn so that was I mean I could have done it I guess more uh, more in a more sophisticated way uh, but this was a simple solution to just flip 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 and uh, and limit the inrush to total inrush current to the system. And that's it if uh, you're watching this video live at DEF CON. Uh, I think we're going to have a uh, live Q&A after this. If not, if you're watching this video offline, you are welcome to write me at my QRZ email address.